So before I introduce tonight's distinguished guest, I just want to tell you a little bit about this library. And most of you probably know, but it was founded in 1754. One of the early members was George Washington. And here's what you probably don't know. He checked out two books, never returned them. <laughs> so we decided to waive the late fee. <clears throat> which would have been about $300,000, we figure that's, that's, not, uh, that's not nothing. And on that subject, I would just like to mention that we are at this moment in the middle of our annual, um, sorry, <clears throat> our annual fund drive. We just do this once a year. And for everybody who has contributed, thank you so much. And for anybody who might just be thinking about it, it would be wonderful if you could make a contribution. No contribution is too small. <clears throat> Every contribution is deeply appreciated. Okay, now for the main event. I want to tell you just a very short story. Once upon a time, long, long ago, actually it was 1957, I was an editor in the book publishing business, and I went to the monthly lunch of a group called the Publishers Lunch Club that was held every month, the Yale Club. The speaker that day was a man named Joseph Cannon, and he had just completed his first novel, Los Alamos, and he read from it. Maybe 97. Did I want to say I have a writer and an editor here. Yeah. It's, yeah, I'll give you some secrets later. <laughs> It was 97, I do apologize. And Joe had been an executive in the publishing business, and I knew of him that way, but I didn't actually know him. So he read in 1997 from Los Alamos, and I was knocked out. I'd heard a lot of writers reading from a lot of books, and I had never heard anything that equaled Joe. And it was so impressive. He went on to win several prizes for that book, and after that, he wrote, um, the Prodigal Spy in 1998, and then The Good German in 2001, Alibi in 2005, Stardust in 2009, and Istanbul Passage, the book he'll be talking about tonight, obviously this year. I just want to read one short comment from a critic. This is written by or from a best-selling author um, whose name I just lost, so, oh, sorry. It's Olin Steinhauer, and this is what Mr. Steinhauer said about, about Joe's new novel. He says, Istanbul Passage bristles with authenticity. Joseph Cannon has a unique and admirable talent. He brilliantly marries suspense and historical fact, wrapping them around a core of pure human drama while making it seem effortless. <clears throat> this isn't just talent. This is magic. I'm very happy to introduce the magical Joseph Cannon. Well, that was typically generous of Betty, but who doesn't appreciate generosity, so thank you. First things first, can everybody hear, and I mean the people in the comfy seats, you know who you are, because I have been in events in this room where I hear people leaving saying, I was fine, but I didn't hear a thing. So if at any point my voice goes off, just do a hand signal, okay? I can't thank you enough for having me. I know that people always say that at events, but it's really true in this case. At just about the time that Biddy heard me at the Publishers Lunch Club for Los Alamos was, I think, when I joined this library. So I've been coming here for about 20 years. 
And like a lot of writers, I have used it, I have worked upstairs, and I have especially loved the OpenStack policy. There is, in fact, a whole plot strand in this current book that would not have existed if I hadn't been rooting around downstairs and come across a book that I didn't know about that gave me a whole new slant on something that had happened during the war. So it's a valuable resource, but even beyond that, for these 20 years, I have been coming and seeing the newsletters with other writers speaking, and getting on the elevator to see the flyers with other writers appearing in a month or so, and then the call came, and they said, would you like to speak? And I went, oh, legitimate at last. You know, I finally, met, you really know you're in when the Society Library has you, so I really appreciate that. I know that often what happens here is a very serious and trenchant lecture. That is not what's going to happen tonight. And sometimes people like to read from their books. I find that whenever they do that, they say, I'm just going to read two pages, and then about eight volumes later, they're still droning on, and I'm comatose in that, just with boredom. So what I would prefer to do instead, if it's okay with you, is to talk about the book, how it came to be, how you patch together the book, and if you want to read two pages, we can do that, but we can also, or instead, do questions, because the one-on-one -on -one is fun. I find that when I do events at bookstores and libraries, things like this, that what people really enjoy are two parts. They enjoy the one-on-one -on -one of actually talking back and forth to the writer, the, the questions, but they also enjoy hearing about the process. They're really interested in how the books come together. I mean, this can be from something as mundane as, do you write in longhand or do you use a computer, and these are interesting questions to people. Back to the, or forward to the most exalted kind of things, like where, how long did you live there, why this book, and ultimately what they will say is, where did you get the idea? How did this book really come about? How did it get into your head? And it's always an impossible question to answer because ideas are in code. They come from everywhere. You never know what will strike you or what will inspire you to do something. Agatha Christie famously said that she got all of her ideas in the bathtub, which I don't believe, but she sold millions, so you know, who's going to work with that? In this one particular instance, though, about process, I'm very lucky because I do know where I got the idea for almost all of my books. It always begins for me with place. I wrote Los Alamos, the very first novel that Betty mentioned, because I'd been out in New Mexico uh, as a tourist, and I was interested in the Manhattan Project, and I went there and was so fascinated by the place that I wanted to know more. And I became immersed in studying up, sort of researching about it, and finally the book almost suggested itself. This is a process that's happened again and again. I went to uh, Berlin uh, because I was fascinated by the American occupation, which I knew practically nothing about, and nor did I discover did most other people in contemporaries. And I wanted to know how that was, how that had happened there. This book, Istanbul Passage, is very much in that mode. I'm standing here tonight because a few years ago, with my wife, I went to Istanbul as a tourist, and I fell in love with it. I know that this is not a unique reaction. I think those of you who have been, or those of you who might even be going, and I'm not a shill for the Turkish tourist board, I was not accused of that, because I really like Istanbul. But I think anyone who has been there loves it to one degree or another. The beautiful topography, the water traffic, just the Bosphorus itself, the food, the people, all of these elements, the beautiful architecture, Sinan's fabulous mosques and minarets, all of these things conspire to make it one of the great cities for visitors. But what makes it, for me in any case, truly special, and not just a wonderful place to visit, is the layering of history that you find there. You know, we're thrilled if we see a Civil War reenactment or a Victorian house on the Hudson, and that's fine, and it's all well in its place. 
But when you go to Istanbul, you are standing on millennia of human experience, and so much of it is visible, and so much of it is tantalizingly just under the surface. When you arrive, for instance, at the airport, take a taxi, because they're reasonable, and why wait for the bus? And the taxi will undoubtedly get off the highway as you're getting into town and shoot across the old city on Ataturk Boulevard. And there will be cars whizzing by on either, in either direction. But just lift your eyes up at one point, because you'll see some arches. And it's the, Valen, Valen's, um, the Emperor Valens architect of uh, Aqueduct, which is fifth century, still going, still withstanding the traffic, and as recently as a century ago, still delivering water to the city. After you drop your bags, make your first stop. Go to the top of Galata Tower. This was put up by the Genoese who had a trading concession there in the 14th century. It is still very much part of the landscape, and it has one of the great unparalleled views, because as you stand there, in front of you, you will be looking at old Istanbul, the old city, with its pin cushion of minarets and just that postcard view of Istanbul that you're all familiar with. To your right is the Golden Horn, the great harbor of the ancient world. To your left, the Bosporus, the reason for all of this in the first place. Now just crowded with oil tankers that are passing through up to Russia and other places on the Black Sea. But back in the day, it was Jason sailing the Argo. There are thought to have been people where you're standing since the 7th century BC. This is not going to be a long history lesson. I'm not doing that. And it was a tiny Greek trading village called Byzantium. And it grew and prospered for nearly a thousand years, becoming part of the Roman Empire, and ultimately becoming the Roman Empire's new capital, Constantinople, after the emperor. The reign of those emperors, the Byzantines, lasted another thousand years. And to the delight of all researchers who were looking at this, um, years of unparalleled decadence and violence and drama. That they, they, really, they murdered each other all the way, all the way down and slept with each other as they were doing it. So it's really fun to investigate that period. But by 1453, they were played out, and the Ottoman Turks <coughs> took the city and kept it for another 400 years. They made the city that we're familiar with, the land of the cityscape that you will see even today, the harem, the sultan, all the things you associate with old Istanbul, or Ottoman, really. And they lasted until 1922, when the Sultanate was abandoned and an army officer called Ataturk, or as he became Ataturk, Kemal Pasha, he was originally, um, declared modern Turkey and was the first head of the new republic, the country that we pretty much know today. This is, by the way, the end of the history lesson. But it is also where most of the guidebooks stop. And surely it's enough for anybody just to investigate those periods, and it, it was. But I wanted to know more. I wanted to know how the city that was around us now had come to be. And I was particularly interested in the time that I had written about before. Without, which is the immediate post-war period in 45, 46, without intending it when I wrote Los Alamos, I proceeded subsequently to write a series of novels, all of which are set in that period, and all of which are examining different places and their experience after this horrible cataclysm of the war, how, how it affected them, how they responded. In Los Alamos, it's American triumphalism. In Berlin, it's a complete moral devastation and physical devastation. Uh, there's the Hollywood of stardust, which is its apotheosis, its greatest moment. And I thought, well, what was it like here? What happened in Istanbul during that period? I knew that it had been neutral all during the war. The Turks had had a really horrific experience in the First War, which essentially brought down the Ottoman Empire, or hastened its collapse. And they were determined to stay out of the Second and to remain neutral. They were tugged on by all sides, come in, stay out, come in, we want your chromium, we want this. And they were in a balancing act all during the war not to get into it. I thought, all right. But what's it like to sit that out if you're 80 or 90 miles away from the Balkans where the war is raging and if the boats are passing through to the war in the Black Sea? How do you just 
sit it out neutrally? What's that experience like? So the more I looked into it, the more I discovered that, of course, you don't sit it out. Uh, not in that, not that war, anyway. If you don't go to it, it will come to you. And the war came to Istanbul in many ways, some of which are going to be explored in this book. And they were all the various passages of the Istanbul passage. But one of the ways in which the war came was in the form of spies, lots and lots of spies. As a neutral country that was right on the edge of the hot war zone, and as a great old cosmopolitan capital that had its own attractions and a magnetic draw, it was just irresistible, and everyone was there. The old Brit spies, the Nazis, of course, the very, very experienced Russians, the new Americans who were just trying it out for the first time. The OSS was two years old in 1945, and people were essentially learning on the job and making it up as they went along. And, but they had a full field force in Istanbul. They were undercover at the Office of War Information, um, at the Lend Lease Office, Red Cross, even I discovered at Westinghouse or Western Electric, which gave me the idea to use a businessman, but I'd come to that. And I thought, well, and in turn, they're all watching each other, and in turn, they are all being watched by the Emniyet, the Turkish secret police, who not only have the home team advantage, they really know the city very well, but they have had centuries of experience of it. The Ottomans were notorious for their sense of intrigue and their spies and their ability in that field. And I thought, you know, for someone who writes the sort of books that I write, this is catnip. This is, it's <laughs> as if I had fallen into this great subject. And this was solidified for me when I came across a description of an evening at the Park Hotel. In those days, there were two very, very grand hotels where people congregated. One was the Para Palace, which is still with us, by the way, and refurbished. Originally built by the Orient Express people, so that when you got to the end of the line, there would be a suitable hotel for you. In fact, it looks like the Orient Express. They were next door to the American consulate, and consequently were a big watering hole for the West. On the other end of town, near Takshim Square, Next to the German consulate, there was an even grander hotel called the Park Hotel. On one of the hills was a long, long veranda that had one of the great views of the Bosporus. It was a bar and a dining room, very famous. Alas, the park is no more. The first time that I was in Istanbul, it had been replaced by a high-rise parking garage, which I thought was really sad. But on my most recent trip, it turns out that the high-rise parking garage is now in turn being converted into condos. So at least somebody will have that view again from the park. But in this evening at the Park Hotel, there was a Japanese agent in that corner, and there was a Russian here, and there was some American, and everybody knew what he was up to because they weren't experienced enough to hide it. And the barmen were there, and they were said, I mean, everybody who worked bar was said to be on somebody's payroll, and somebody, and some of them were on more than one payroll, often two. And I thought, well, but this is Rick's Cafe. This is Casablanca. This is a subject you could not have made, just came to you. And I thought, so what happens after Ingrid gets on the plane? What happens when it's not so black and white and crisp and romantic? What really happened in Istanbul? And at this point, I was hooked, and I knew I had my subject. What you had to do then, or what I had to do then, was to live in Istanbul in 1945. To do this, which is part of what I consider the pleasurable process of writing, I also like the writing itself, but the research for me is a really wonderful part of this. In some ways, because you really do have to go there in your head and become part of it. And to do so, you need to do what I call um, literary archaeology. You have to dig under. The city that we see around us now and even may love, yes, there were vestiges and there's architecture, but it's a very different place from the one that existed then. Aside from anything else, there are approximately 12 to 15 million more people all sprawled over the hills and transforming it into a, an urban center. It's a much smaller city then. There are bridges now that didn't exist then. The tram lines have been discontinued. Street names have been changed. And you want to get these things right because 
Aside from the problem of people writing you emails and pointing out when you get things wrong, which people love to do, you don't want to stop readers on the page with an error, and you want this world you're creating to be accurate. So you want to get the bones right, and you want to know what were the restaurants? Where would you have gone? Um, where were the smart people living? If you could live anywhere, what neighborhood was fashionable then? Um, all of my book, all of my characters in books, I know where they live. I know in Istanbul where Leon lives. I know if he has to walk to work, how long it's going to take. The people who actually live in this building aren't aware of this, but that's where Leon used to live. I think it's important to do that. It's a kind of sleight of hand that you play with yourself, but it works. And finally, when you have the bones, the map, so to speak, of the city, you then have to fill these streets with people. And to do that, you have to do something trickier. And this is where the magical thinking, I think, comes in. You have to go back in time. Time is a really slippery and much more elastic thing than we're aware of. We see the world right now, tonight, from where we're at in time. And it's very, very difficult not to, not to see it that way. Uh, as an example, I mean, things that seem remote to us, hopelessly distant, in fact, in 1945, were just part of the zeitgeist. They were part of what living memory would have been. Um, as an example, as I said before, the Sultanate was abolished in 1922. This seems to us something that happened in the Middle Ages. This is a long, long time ago, something out of Alibaba. But if you had been an Istanbulu in 1945, it would only have been 23 years ago. In contemporary terms, that would be 1989, and our sultan would be Ronald Reagan. And I don't think of him on a timeline with the Middle Ages. I think of him as part of our contemporary experience. And so it would have been for the people you see in the streets, some of whom would have been retainers who worked for that, quote, administration, but who worked for the sultan. And now we're either lost in a haze of nostalgia or we're getting on with things or whatever the reaction would be, but it would be very much a tangible part of their lives. Sometimes just looking at a date would suggest the character itself. I was reading about the abolishment of the harem in 1909 and followed a coup they were trying to modernize. And what happened to the girls I thought was poignant and interesting. And I thought, well, that's. 36 years ago, that's, I mean, to us it seems like something that's truly out of a fairy tale. But in fact, since some of the girls were very young, it was like a geisha school, they would take you in as a child and then train you in behavior and dress, etc. There must have been women in 1945 Istanbul who had been in the harem, who had been slaves, slave girls, maybe even some of the people who were tonight at the Park Hotel having a drink two booths away. Therefore, I had to use one of these characters, and Lily came into existence, for any of you who've actually read the book. Lily was actually um, uh, useful to me because I also wanted to have a party at one of the great yalis. For any of you who have been there, the whole of the Bosphorus is lined by these waterfront mansions from the Ottoman period, and I thought, well, you can't write a book about Istanbul and not have a great party scene in a yali. So I have Lily not only surviving the harem and what happened to it, but having married well and is now one of the great hostesses, and she gives the big party in the book. Other people began to crowd into these streets, and you saw that what was going on in 1945 was this fabulous to me hodgepodge of experience and different kinds of Turks, all having a different reaction to things. You know. They had only had the Western alphabet for 18 years. So this means that unless you were a young child, there had to have been a time in your life when you were literally thrust into the West, when you had to do a sea change of that nature. I mean, imagine if you had to learn a new alphabet next week, and you had to learn it. You weren't going to go back. So all of these people with these various experiences are going around, and I also realized at this time that probably the expatriate American-European community, where the book would largely be set because I am an American, would probably not be aware of most of this. They would probably, almost in a neo-colonial way, think of it as a matter of indifference. They weren't curious 
in all the readings that I could find on this um, period, about what was going on with the Turks. They were absorbed with themselves. They were absorbed with the lives that they were leading there. And in a more generous way, they were absorbed by the war. The war was happening. This was, this was an all-encompassing concern for people. And a lot of them were absorbed in espionage. This wasn't all just trench coats. This could be stuff like people in their apartments, if they had the right apartment on the Bosporus, would literally just count the ships as they went by or make notes about who was sailing back and forth. There were any number of things you could do. But in order to straddle these worlds, because I wanted to get this colitis, this mosaic, let's say, of Istanbul 45, which is really my subject rather than any plot, I needed a protagonist who could straddle both worlds. And therefore, we have the American businessman Leon Bauer. Bauer, for those of you who know in German, means farmer, but it also means pawn. And Leon loves and knows Istanbul. He's been there for years. But he, and so he appreciates this polyglot kind of variety of life that's going on all around him. But he is also part of the expatriate community. And he is drawn to this shadow world of, his, of espionage in a way that people were, partly out of glamour. There's a kind of frisson with being at the park of an evening, but also out of patriotism. It was his way of doing something for the war effort. If, if someone in the consulate asked him to do a job or asked him to be a courier, do these odd jobs, A, you did it because it was a good thing to do. But it also, for him, is an attractive and kind of exciting thing to do. And what's going to happen as this pawn is moved across a very elaborate chessboard is that his passage is going to be to the dark underside of espionage. And what he will have to discover is that if you are one of the people who are making webs, be very, very careful you don't fall in one yourself. His is not the only passage. In Istanbul Passage, there is a purely nautical one in a boat that's very like the one on the cover, except that it would be leaky and creaky and um, overcharged by some unscrupulous person on the Black Sea, and it would be filled with desperate Jewish refugees. I discovered, and in fact, a large part of it here, the society, that one of the main, one of the important things that was happening in Istanbul during this period is that it was operating as one of the very few escape valves for Jews all during the war to get out. I, if you were like me, you probably had the notion that after 1939, this was a closed walled fortress and nobody got out. And that's pretty much the case, but there were exceptions. And if you were lucky enough or rich enough to bribe the right person or lucky enough, uh, in a miraculous way, you might legally be on the train that still ran from uh, Vienna to Baghdad and ultimately get to Palestine. But mostly you wouldn't be lucky or that rich. And mostly you would be desperate and you would try anything to escape because you were escaping death itself. And you would get on one of these boats. And if you could get out of Constanta in Romania and get past the um, explosives that are in the Black Sea, you got mines, the sea mines, the German U-boats. I mean, before I started looking into all this, I never even knew that there was a naval war in the Black Sea and that the U-boats were there fighting the Russians. So this was all fresh and new to me. But if you could survive these various obstacles and get a transit visa through Istanbul and other things, you might ultimately end up in Palestine. I thought originally when I looked into this that, well, this is a kind of minor thing, but it wasn't a minor thing. The Mossad, um, the committee of Palestinians who were in charge of organizing the Al Yabet, the illegal immigration, maintained an office in Istanbul in the Hotel Continental all during the war. And they were constantly trying to save people and get them out. This is something that Leon would have been very familiar with because his wife, German Jew, was involved with Mossad in rescuing these people and has paid a terrible psychic price for it. But what Leon doesn't know, and what I didn't know until I looked into this, 
is that even within this larger horror story, things are always worse. There is yet another worse element. And I thought this is a very important part of what happened in Istanbul. It's really unknown. It turned out that toward the end of the war, the corrupt Balkan governments, and particularly the Romanians, having been part of the Axis alliance, after Stalingrad realized the war was going in the other direction and that the Russians were going to invade them. So out of venality and out of maybe trying to store up some good credits for afterwards to prove that they hadn't been war um, offered Jews for sale and offered them at $300 a head children, adults, it didn't matter, whatever the number. I found this extraordinary, um, and I thought, what do you do with that? How, what's the reaction? And in fact, the reaction had been the Joint Distribution Committee, Jewish Refugee Organization, and the American government both said, we can't just turn away, we can't give this a pass, these people are being murdered. I should preface, by the way, that the Romanian government offering, making this offer, was also the only government other than Germany itself that had actually built death camps. So if you didn't agree to this deal, um, these people were sent and killed. Enter, um, in fact, a, an executive from Bloomingdale's who was appointed as the special envoy to go over and negotiate in Istanbul and in Ankara, the official capital, but mostly in Istanbul. And FDR was told, I mean, nobody was told about this. And Morgenthau, the Treasury, was told because he had to have a waiver from them because you were technically, if you involved yourself in any business in Romania, you were trading with the enemy. And it was an illegal act. He claims to have got some 15,000 people out. I would have been astonished at 10. And I thought, this is a really extraordinary event. It was unknown to me. It's, I think, a really key episode in Istanbul's wartime history. I want it in the book. It also serves as a really wonderful plot function, but never mind about that. <laughs> there is the passage of a defector, a Romanian, who is going to change his last side and use his last chip to find asylum in America. He knows a lot about the Russians, and now, all of a sudden, the Americans want to know a lot about the Russians, so much so that they are willing to take him. It's his defection that starts all the, act the action in the book. They're not only willing to take him, but they're pretty much willing to overlook all the allegations of the personal baggage that he's carrying, which are atrocities and war crimes that are truly horrific. So much so that we think that anybody might break under the pressure of this. This is somebody that Leon should despise and does despise, and yet, and yet, as they begin to spend more and more time together, he develops a very peculiar empathy for him. What is happening is that this murderer is now the hunted and now about to be the victim, and in any case is totally in Leon's hands. And the question is, if you have somebody's life in your hands, what do you do with it, even if he's a monster? There is the passage of a faithful wife, the consulate, to infidelity. This is the love story that I think is the spine of the book because the divided loyalties that this represents for both of them really mirror what's going on elsewhere in the book. But finally and ultimately, the passage is really Leon's moral passage. It's really, I think, ultimately the theme what the book is about. Where do you draw the line? How do you create the parameters of your own personal morality? What won't you do? He has been spending the entire war, like Istanbul itself, on this tightrope. The original working title for this book was Tightrope. And being pushed by either side. And he's going to have to, he's going to, have to make a decision. At one point in the book, toward the end, he said, what do you do when there's no right thing to do? Just the wrong thing, either way. I think that life frequently affords us bad choices. What's the least harmful thing you can do? What's the lesser of these two evils? And what life rarely does, or almost never does, 
is give you the option not to make one. This is about the choice that Leon finally has to make. He has to make it in Galata Bridge, as a matter of fact. I hope that the getting there, the twisty, turny, and maybe intrigue-filled way he gets there, not only mirror the streets of Istanbul itself, um, but you will find as attractive and interesting as this great city, which concludes this part. Now, we can either read the two pages that stretch into eight volumes, or we could do questions. It's really up to you, or we could do questions anyway, but what would you like to do? Read something. Read something, okay. You just want to see me with my glasses. All right, since you ask, and all of you in comfortable chairs, you know, do not nod as too much. So that we're at Lily's party. She's giving a grand party at her yali. And Kay, who's with Leon, has said to her, tell me about being in the, in the harem. You know, tell me about that. Um, she had mentioned her old husband, Rafik, who is, she's a widow. You were in love with him, Kay said. What a question, Lily said. Suddenly tentative, surprised with this. Certainly. And she has learned how to speak in France. And so I'm not going to do any accent, but you have to imagine her as very soigné and elegant. Certainly, but love. It's not always so reliable, you know. It changes. But with us, there was also a debt. I owed him everything. How could there be anyone else who rescued me? Literally? Oh, a long story, not for a party. Leon, you must know this, how Rafik found me after the harem. Only that he did. Tell me, Kay said, do you mind? Mind? Lily was saying, delighted to have an audience. Well, everybody wants to know about the harem. What was it like? Something romantic. But it wasn't like that. That house in you, it's nothing to do. Games with the other girls. What did we learn? How to act, how to dress. And what good was that when it was over? People don't ask that, what happened after. Nobody thought. After they sent Abdul Hamid to Salan Salanika, there we were, and no one knew what to do with us. Hundreds of girls, some children. So they took us to Tokapi. It was the first time I'd ever been there. Damn, at least the Yildiz had been warm. And then they sent messengers to all the villages where we'd been born. Come and get your daughters. Dressed like, and so, come and get your, I'm so sorry. And, and some did, farmers. And their daughters were dressed like, well, you can imagine the kind of clothes you wore for the sultan, beautiful. And now they're going back to the farm, useless for work. Some didn't want to go, what would happen? Make yogurt, be married off to some ox of a man. So they cried, but of course they had to go. The fathers would sell their jewelry, and that's the last they'd see at Istanbul. If they were still virgin, maybe a marriage in town, somebody who liked good manners. If not, not any marriage that could be arranged. The jewelry would make a bright price, and that was the end of the harem for them. She stopped catching herself. I don't know. Maybe some of the girls were happy to see their families again. There must have been some, yes. But I didn't see it, just the crying. In carts sometimes, they drove away in carts. In Istanbul, imagine. Behind veils, of course, but you could tell they were crying. And these, you know, were the lucky ones. Someone came for them. The rest of us, we think, why doesn't my family come? Maybe they moved from the village. Maybe they never heard the messengers. Maybe this, maybe that. But what you thought was, they don't want me. And now what? We couldn't stay at Tokapi forever. The government didn't want to keep us, the expense. What happens to a girl in Istanbul who knows what? How to make herself attractive? To find it, one of those houses. What else? If you were a virgin, they could sell your first night. Good money for them. After that, you were just in a house, one of the, well, you know what that was. And that's what I thought would happen to me. They'd lock me up in one of those houses until they could sell my first night, and then the rest. Who knows what it's really like, just things you hear. Maybe it's worse, but then I was rescued. She looked up at Kate, not briefly, not yet. The first rescue was Nefbe, one of the girls. Her parents had died, but they had friends who came for her to adopt her, and she said, please, would they take me too? I don't think they wanted to. One daughter was all they could afford, but Nefbe said they could take me as a servant. I could do housework, whatever they liked, a servant, but I wouldn't be put out in the streets, and you know, they were all right. And then when 
never been married and left the house, they kept me. Not a daughter, not a servant, something in between. But there wasn't money to arrange a marriage. So what's the future? And then, Rafik, some business, and he comes to the house and he sees me. What happens between people? Do we know? I don't. No, Kay said, looking at Leon. It just happens. So it happens for him, Lily says. Why? I don't know. And a few days later, he's back. And then back again, and then they tell me he wants to marry me. No bright price, no family, but never mind. Not some arrangement, a girl in a room. They would never have agreed to that marriage. So my first night was with my husband. Not some house in Tofani. She moved her hand toward Kay. Love, not then. But the debt began. And everything that happened after, she extended her arm to the alley. The life we had, you know, in the harem, you want to be good stuff. One who's noticed, Abdul Hamid never did. I was too young, but Rafiq did. I was gerstet to him. I sometimes think what would have happened to me if they'd kept the harem, become a kadiva to Abdul Hamid, an old crazy man. Maybe now I'd even be valida. She shook her head, but never have this life, never see Paris, anywhere. So it was lucky for me, Rafik, better than the Sultan. Gerstet. Kay said, trying to pronounce it, still in the story. Yes, it means in the eye. And it was true, I was. So later, when there were other women, I'd think, well, they're women. But I'm the one in his eye. You didn't mind if, yes, at first it's terrible. You think it's the end of the world. But you know, the world doesn't end. It just becomes something else. I remember when the Ottomans finally left, the last ones, the household, children, Grandchildren, I went to Sirkaji to see it. I knew some of them from the old days, so I was curious. They put them on the Orient Express, one way. And this woman at the station, maybe a servant, tears and wailing, it's the end of the world. And this is 24, when Kemal Pasha is already making a new turkey. So whose end? Well, listen to me, who talks like this? Old women. She put her hand on Leon's upper arm, patting it. Don't make trouble with my Russian. You know, everyone comes to my house. <laughs> so, that's what happened to the hero. Now, do you want to do questions? I enjoyed the book thoroughly. I thought it was terrific. <laughs> and uh, I, I finished like three or four months ago. For me, the most memorable character is the city. And I'm surprised. I thought you must have lived there for five or six years to accomplish that. How much research time you have to spend before putting pen to paper on something like that. Right. I've been about five times. Um, I've never lived there for you know, a year at a time or anything like that. Often when I'm seriously doing this, when I'm really researching, and in fact I'm about to go to Berlin because the next book is I'm going back to Berlin, I, I walk the city. There's a kind of moment, you get into a kind of fugue state where you just want to know everything about it and then you've read everything you can and you just need to be there. Usually alone, by the way, I think it's better. And you, you need to measure things like, you know, what do you walk to work? I mean, you just, you get to know, and essentially you go to live there in your head. I was once asked this question, I mean, in a similar way, there was, uh, after the good German, someone said, how long did you live in Berlin? And I said, well, I didn't live in Berlin, but for about a year and a half every day, I got up and I got on the subway and I went to Berlin in my head. And this is the way you do it. I do most of my work at the NYPL, so it's, it's like that. So I've been numerous times, but I have never spent a long stretch. You know, part of it is language. There's a limit to how much I can do there. Did you already have a sense from your prior sort of post-war work of the sort of bizarre connections between the U.S. and the Russians and the Turkish and Islam. Some. But, I f you know, I find what's interesting is that I tend to write about things that you know a little about, but you need to know more. It's almost like signing up for an, an elective and a new graduate course, and, you know, you say, I want to know this, I want to know more about it. So that there's a pleasure for you, too, in learning it. It's, it's in the same way that when I actually write the books, I mean, I know some people use outlines. I never do. I mean, it's slightly disingenuous to say you make it up as you go along, but you do. Partly, you want the surprise, too, of the book turning in directions you don't expect. 
I mean, I want it to be fun for me. I don't want it just to follow on that one. Yeah. Yeah, what was the thought behind um, having Leon's wife sort of in a vegetative state? Um, and Leon would visit his um, lady friend once a week or whatever, or whatever, or whatever in the lane or whatever. Right. Um, but, but I couldn't understand why, what was the, why you made that choice. Leon would go and he would, you know, she, you know, fluff up the pillows and this, that, and the other thing. But what was the, what was the sort of sense of, that you were trying to achieve? Well, there were, there were two things. One is that, um, for those of you who haven't read it, his wife suffered great trauma during the, um, one of these episodes of the boat. And she is in a kind of comatose state, and she may never come back. And he is very, very much in love with her. But what's happening is that as she has gone away, even though she's physically there, she's not there for him. And what we want is a kind of yet another piece of pressure on his loyalties. I mean, what I wanted to accomplish was there was who do you, what, what, what are your priorities here? I mean, who are you loyal to? What are you doing? Um, in the same way that are you loyal to your country at all times? Are you loyal to just this person you love, etc.? It was also a device, too, because I knew that I could do scenes where he is talking aloud to her. And in a way, he can, instead of doing an interior monologue, uh, you can actually hear what's going on in his head without having to do that thing of he thought. So it was, it was mostly that. But it's really about who does he choose in the end? What, where, are his, where are his loyalties? But he certainly had no, no, no difficulty from a, from a morality standpoint, being very concerned and indulgent of his wife and then going to see his. Well, it's true that after a, few, after a few years, he started seeing somebody once a week. But in his own compartmentalized way, what he's saying is he wasn't having an affair with another wife or somebody in their world. He was just literally seeing somebody in a room. Look, I'm not advocating this, but I think that it's behavior that in 1945 probably would have been more acceptable than it is now. But he was always very concerned about how many more men, you know, I mean... Sure, because you get jealous. You just do. I mean, she's very sensible about this. She said, you know, even as they're handing, even as they're handing you the money, they always want to think it's for love. <laughs> yeah. In your research, did you uh, talk to people who lived at the time? I mean, uh, there are a lot of us who were alive during World War II, who were right. quite adult, as a matter of fact. Did you talk to people who were in Turkey? Yes, a few, but very few. Partly because I just didn't have access to them. You know, there's a peculiar thing about this, though. Um, for instance, with Los Alamos, I had access to some of the scientists who are still with us. I mean, a lot of them died early because of the radiation. But there were some people who were still around. And what happened? As a matter of circumstance, I talked to them afterwards, after I'd done the book, because I didn't know that I had this conduit to them. And in the end, I'm glad I did, because I think what happens is that we all remember what we remember, but we remember it from our own point of view. And if five of you were to describe this evening tonight, there were, I would get five different versions. And so what you really want is a kind of broader spectrum. And I find that when you... Um, that print is even a more reliable guide, and particularly things that were written at the time. I mean, if you get anything like letters or journals, that's gold, because you're, it's really contemporary. But I find even that um, journalism is interesting, just the, the assumptions that are being made internally within the piece. Um, I mean, if you ask me now about something that happened in 1974, which is not so long ago to me, I don't know that I'd really get it right. I think we all misremember. We would like not to, but I, but I think we do. So in a way, it's, it's useful not. And of course, in this particular instance, since I am not fluent in Turkish, I mean, I can barely navigate a restaurant menu in Turkish. And you, 
you know, you want the polite words and you want to be able to get along. But I could never really interview someone in Turkish. So that I was limited though. Yeah. I'm curious about, I guess we call it the creative process. Uh, the thing to me that defines a novel is the interaction of character. <clears throat> and uh, do these characters come to you fully formed and do you stick them in a plot? Or do you have a plot and you have sort of half-formed characters? And I mean, how do the two, the plot and the characters work together? Okay, I too believe that everything is character-based. Um, I can't even remember the plots of my own books a few years later, and I don't think we, you know, we remember Moby Dick because it's simple, but basically we remember the characters, and those those people, especially if they're alive to you, do they come fully formed? Not necessarily. I mean, the first thing, this is where the magical thinking comes in, and you know, it's, it, I always used to wonder if Frank Sinatra went out there every night and thought, oh my God, what if I open my mouth and nothing comes out? <laughs> you know, we, we don't know how that really happens. But when I started this book, I had one image in mind, which is him waiting, the first scene, him waiting in the rain on the Bosporus. And I don't know where that came from. The wife was fully formed to me, and Lily, um, I knew the moment she was on the page. But I think there's also a lot of funny talk about all this, you know, when people say, oh, it just all came alive for me on, you know, um, the characters just came alive and they created themselves. Well, they don't, you know, you're sitting there with a pen and you're doing it. The only time I ever had an experience that's like that cliche writing class experience was in Los Alamos. I was writing that there was, um, early on in the book, there's an investigation, which is the whole point of the plot, and in order to sanction this, you would need an okay from Oppenheimer, who's the head of the project. And Oppenheimer is someone I have enormous respect for and like, and would never, I, feel, I think that using real people is always a tricky thing in fiction. At some point it becomes exploitative and you don't want to do that, or at least I didn't. And I thought, I don't, you know, I don't want to trash Oppenheimer or get this wrong. And he's someone, if you don't revere him, at least you deeply respect him. However, who else was going to sanction this? I mean, it would be like saying that somebody other than Roosevelt was president. It's just as silly to, you know, to make up someone. So I thought, all right, we'll have our character walk in, and let's just get it done very quickly and do no harm and do no damage. And Oppenheimer will say, sure, go to it, and that's it. And that writing class cliche thing happened the minute I walked into the room with Oppenheimer. He took over the book and became, in fact, I realized why I was interested in the first place. And to me, is the great character in the book. So it can happen that the characters take on lives of themselves, but usually you're directing them. Yeah. Can you give us a quick tease on the next book? And oh, well, I always say I'm never going to say anything because you talk it out, you know, or you'll say, and then people look at you with a, um, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, God. But I will tell you where, since it's always a place, I'm going back to Berlin, um, but this time, the good German was really about the Allied occupation, and so by definition, it was all in West Berlin. And this one, I'm more interested in the East, and the formation of the GDR and how that happened. I, I think it's something we know very little about, and we just assume that it was another Soviet client state, but it's a, it was an anomaly and really a very peculiar situation, and one that has a lot of moral nuance and um, ideological complexity. So I was fascinated by the East, and now that it's open, um, there are so many more things you can go and see and do there that it's, um, you know, I mean, my wife thinks it's ridiculous because she'll send me an email saying, what did you do today? And I'll say, oh, I thought I'd start out by seeing the concentration camp at Sachsenhausen. You know, she said, nobody writes these kind of emails when they're on a trip. But I have visited the Stasi headquarters, which are really fascinating. And for those of you who've seen that excellent movie on um, the lives of others, you know, it's like, and the files, one of the truly riveting things about them that, and my German is limited, but some of them have been translated. 
is how much of it is just like Facebook. I mean, it's the stuff that we're giving away for free. And you think, if they had just waited for Mark Zuckerberg, they would have <laughs> gone through all this trouble. I mean, you can't imagine how mundane it is. Yeah. yeah. Who can admire uh, fiction writers? Lots and lots. I mean, including living ones, yes. you know, because I think most writers are so ungenerous and they only like Shakespeare. You know, or somebody <laughs> who's conveniently dead, but I do like a lot of writers. And I like a spectrum. D don't you find that what I find so wonderful is that it's inexhaustible. I mean, just when you think you've run out because what is there to read, it turns out there's lots. Um, I had never read Don DeLillo's Underworld, and I thought, well, I guess I should. That's really a major, sort of terrific book. In this field, in um, thrillers, there's a kind of spectrum. I certainly admire Alan first. I like his books. Uh, I think Lee Child is terrific. I mean, he writes these pure action books, but he's a good writer, and I think the character is just terrific for each other, so I have a good time with him, you know. And there are the usual suspects. Does anybody not like Le Carre? You know, when everyone falls at the altar of Graham Greene, and rightly so. I mean, Graham Greene, you know, whenever that comparison is made, you think that's, that's the one you want to hear. Although, oddly enough, I think what happens is that it's used so often in reviews of thrillers. And really what they're talking about is the third man. I think they're talking about the movie, and they're not really talking about the books, but I take it as the books because they're really wonderful. Yeah? Yeah, let me just ask one other question. I thought it was fascinating the way you named the chapters after history. In the, was, that, was that a way of trying to develop parts of Istanbul in, as well as what was going on in the book itself? Yeah, each of the parts of the book is given the name of the district where most of the action takes place in that part. But it was also just sublimity, I guess, to give you the sense that what we were doing here was a mosaic of this city. And that even though um, the first section is Bebek, for instance, because that's where the action starts. But it's also where we're introduced to the European community who had settled there. And it's showing you one part of this temple, excuse me, and then in part two, we're going to go to another one, more or less. So it was just to, and to add to that sense that Istanbul is the real character of the book, it's why I changed the title from the working title, because I wanted to emphasize the city. Yeah, last one. To return to the history of Turkey, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how the Turkish government function during this time? Where were they? Because your, your police right. force is pretty brutal. Right. It was, the Turks in 1945, it was nominally a democratic republic. In fact, it was a charismatic dictatorship as long as Ataturk was there. Um, it was a one-party country. Very much the way Mexico was for 20 or 30 years, you know, it was just that one party that ran it. But not like Stalin. You know, we're, not, we're not talking about that, that level of um, craziness. But when Ataturk died, which was 38, I guess, anyway, right before the war, um, his successor, Iannini, um came in for the next 50 years. I mean, it was the Ataturk party, even though there was another party, uh, was so dominant and was in power for so long, and with the aid of the military, that it, was, it functioned in that way. It was also, because he was so charismatic, um, you get this sense, we're not talking about a country that was extraordinarily repressive to its own people. I mean, there are many other things to answer for, you know, the Armenians and the Kurds, etc. but this was not the purges of Stalin, I mean, that, that sort of thing didn't happen. And it was widely accepted to be the only way to thrust the country into, the, um, into some form of modernity. You know, what we forget that now is a very vibrant, prosperous, it's in fact becoming the Ottoman Empire again. I mean, Istanbul is reasserting itself as the, the chief city of that region and the great entrepot and the great business center. So it's all come full circle. 
But in those days, it was very recessive and backwaterish, and what it really was was poor. And one of the reasons to stay out of the war that they were so determined to do it, they kept a standing army all during World War II in case the Russians invaded, because that was always you know, the great fear of the Russian bear. And they would have had a, an excuse you know, to control the Bosphorus. So they had to maintain this army, even though they weren't fighting, actively fighting the war, and just at a huge expense, you know, which they didn't have the money. And is that, does that matter? It's not what you would want now, but it's what worked for them then. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Are we done? Okay. I gather that if anybody, if the two of you who haven't already read the book, <laughs> want to get it, they're out right there in that hall, and, and if anybody wants me to sign, Except the library copy, I'm not allowed to do that. But if you want to sign either the new ones or the old ones, I'm happy to do that too. Thank you very much.